Thank you very much for that very fundamental talk, so to say, about simulations and general questions and approaches. And I open the discussion for questions. Yes, please. Well, I think it's a misnomer. If you should have called that why we can simulate the ancient naval warfare. You know? Warfare. Yes. Um, <laughs> I see that I was slightly too successful with, with that part of my talk. Um, the main problem is, the main problem I face is, we actually want to make a simulation of ancient naval warfare, um, but obviously, as you said, that there is this main problem that um, we have to find some way, some clever way of com coming around this problem that the way you usually use simulations requires you to, to know the system you're simulating. And this is not the case with ancient naval warfare. So um, what we try to do is basically simulate something that we know, which is Olympias, and then sort of try to use these results as some way of, if you want, analogy, um, and then um, end up with something that is, could be plausibly um, interpreted as a tactical or operational procedure um, for ancient naval warfare. But the, the end result would not be a simulation of ancient naval warfare. It would rather be a simulation of, well, toying around with Olympians. More questions, comments? Let me take a question. Uh, you said that the, the material to play around is, is poor for obvious yeah. reasons. Um, how much can you integrate information from related fields, so to say, so from, from civil ships and use of civil navigation, civil um, navigation in antiquity, or from um, naval warfare from later periods, like medieval periods, where you have still different types of ships or, 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 or technology, yeah. but still have a similar, similar system constellation, maneuvering hundreds of ships in the sea, which yeah. which cover a certain distance. As a, so how much can you trace on, on these two? The main problem with ancient, um, um, well, with trading vessels um, and ancient um, well, non-naval maritime activity is that ancient warships are very, let's say, um, uh, single-purpose ships in that um, you do not find traders running around with quick marines. So the material that, that we get about what you can do with an ancient trading vessel, um, that is something very different from what you can do with, a, with an ancient warship. Um, therefore, I doubt that you can actually take much use, useful information uh, from that. An interesting question is, um, particularly if we look at the early modern period, there is galley warfare in the Mediterranean until the 18th century extant. There is galley warfare in, um, in, in the Baltic Sea until the 18th century. We have galley warfare to some extent at least in Northwestern Europe, um, likewise um, well into the 18th century. So I could argue that um, there are similarities and um, you can sort of, by using analogies, try to find your way around. There is however one big problem and that is that um, command and control ever since the late 15th century for larger numbers of ships um, rests at sea around something that currently is assumed to have been invented around 1500 or later um, by a couple of inventive Dutchmen, and that's the telescope. If you have a double line of six kilometers and you have a telescope, well, you, you do flag signaling, that's no problem at all. If you do not have a telescope, you can still do flag signaling, but the amount of repeaters you need um, is much higher than with a um, with a 
with telescopes. The standard operational procedure in the early water period for large battle lines is that you have this long battle line of say one or two kilometers and um, in, on, not on the side of the enemy but on the other side you have one or two ships acting as repeaters. So everybody can, can actually look at these ships and they only look at the flagships, repeat the signals. So, and this actually works fairly well um, right down to you know, the late 19th century when they find out that um, flag signaling in the world of steam and shell fire is not a very good thing. Um, but the main problem is the visual signaling at sea works only really well with telescopes. Now I'm not going to risk what's left of my um, professional reputation on suggesting that the ancients already had telescopes because <laughs> um, although there is no, no hard evidence they did not, there is neither hard evidence they did. So this is, that is a major problem. Um, and in fact there is uh, some of the standard literature on early modern naval warfare actually claims organized, large scale organized naval warfare only begins in, a, in the early modern period because the telescope is one of the key necessary inventions for large scale organized naval warfare. And unless you don't, unless you have this telescope, you cannot do that. So antiquity did not have it, so evidently they did not have large scale organized naval warfare. I would say, well then, what happened to Lectomus? You know, it's, um, we are missing something, but... Um, uh, then uh, the matter of uh, the Panko doesn't help you because of the telescope and the cannons? Well, the cannons actually I could probably explain away because to some extent, um, even into the 6th century, you could argue that, that um, gunpowder artillery is not um, uh, significantly more capable than high quality uh, torsion artillery in antiquity. Um, but again, with the Panto, uh, you could argue that um, command control to a certain degree rests on, already rests on the use of the telescope. And that makes things um, difficult. It would nevertheless be, certainly be um, instructive to look at 13th and particularly 14th century um, naval warfare. Um, so that's, it is actually a very good point, um, just comes up to my mind, uh, looking at very, very early Venetian warfare in the, in the 13th and 14th century where they are supposed not to have telescopes. And, um, but I'm not sure whether we have these, these huge numbers of ships uh, actually extant there. I mean, that, that is another problem. We regularly hear about these huge numbers. And the numbers of Cape Economists um, are not exceptional. We are talking here about something like 700 warships. Yes, that's, that's a lot. And in terms of, of manpower, uh, we are talking about perhaps 300,000 men, which is an awful lot. But I mean, you know, the fleet that Caesar took to Britain in the second expedition probably had 800 to 1,000 ships. Um, the fleet that, um, that the Germanicus uh, took to Germany had thousands of more ships. So the Romans do this regularly. And you need to organize this in some way or another. And um, again, there is something is, is, is missing there. Uh, is there any mentioning of signaling system in the ancient literature at all? Yes. Um, we know quite a lot about um, signaling on land. It works. And, and actually, we also know a little bit about signaling on, at, at sea. Um, there was mentioning flags, which is what you would expect. We know quite a lot about um, signaling with fire on land, which is something that you would probably not do at sea. Um, um, there is a in one of the newer Asterix comics, it's a very nice bit where you have one of these poor chaps actually accidentally, one has to say, they, they have two torches and do some sort of very strange things. And at the end of the day, the sail starts to burn and, and, the, um, and the captain makes a report and the midshipman adds to the report 
and in due course of making the signal we burn the ship and then both of them are sort of exact. <laughs> um, but which shows that experimenting with, with um, light signals at sea is probably difficult. Um, on land, it's a, it's a different ballgame, but then again on land, obviously, you don't have these huge distances. Um, again, at Eknos, we have no idea how big these formations were in reality, but if you assume, really assume that we, uh, we have a rubber formation that covers, let's say, around 20 square kilometers, um, and that's only the rubber formation, against which then this Cartagena Admiral tries to do some sort of, you know, enveloping maneuver, um, which would cover a dozen kilometers or so, and for which he needs to react to information he gets from, from the scouting ships. How, the, how that would work is, um, again, at the moment, beyond of, of what we can actually explain. I have a layman's question. <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Um, what did they actually try to achieve? Uh, was it that they tried uh, to, to crush an, 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 an inimical ship uh, by, by ramming it and with a sharp prow or something like that? Or did they want to get close to each side and entering bridges and fighting the, yeah. the, the battle sword to, to sword? Or was it uh, by projectiles on fire and, and trying to bring fire on the enemy's ship? Um, I mean, this yeah, would have changed the maneuvers. maneuvers. Yeah, exactly. That, that is a very important question and one that sort of um, has a direct, um, direct impact on this, this third point. Because um, the tactics change apparently considerably over time. If you look at trial warfare in the fifth century, um, then it's mostly about ramming. Um, and by ramming, um, it's meant that you um, deliver a glancing blow to your opponent. So a glancing blow is something like that. Mm -hmm. Basically, once you um, manage to successfully shear off uh, your opponent's oars, you have won because he cannot move any longer. So that's, that's all you need, really need to do. Um, running your ship head onto the enemy, um, the tactic that, curiously, the late 19th century preferred and thought to have been derived from antiquity was something no ancient captain would have done because the risk of, well, basically making the enemy ship sink and going down with the enemy ship, <laughs> and the structural risk you run when running headlong into an obstacle, um, the, the, the risk for the uh, integrity of your own ship structure, they are so great that this is not a uh, viable maneuver. So you would always, always try to do something like that. Uh, now, that is, as I said, probably the essence of trying to warfare. Um, already during the Peloponnesian War, we can see that boarding also becomes important. Um, early in the 5th century, and in the early years of the Peloponnesian <coughs> War, Mm, trial and warfare still is mainly about ramming, and you have fairly small deck troops, uh, just a couple of um, archers and a couple of basically people trying to shield the, um, uh, the helmsman. Um, but later in the Peloponnesian War, we can see that boarding gains in importance, and once uh, these ships that originally were not completely decked over, and if you look at Olympias, you can actually see that. She is, um, you can see that in a little bit, there is no upper deck. So there is only a small sort of deck over the outriggers, but there is no, in the middle, there is no deck. Now, if you go into the fourth century and then into the Hellenistic period, you have these ships that are fully decked, so they have a, a complete um, upper deck, um, which means more space. You can put more soldiers on these ships. And then obviously, um, once we are in the fourth century, artillery comes into the, into the picture. So what you can see is that the importance of boarding increases, the importance of artillery increases, and the importance of the ram apparently dec decreases, though the ram is, according to, lit to the literature, still in use, um, for example, in the Punic Wars. Um, but things change, at least from from um, the, the days of 
of the triangle effect. And obviously, that is a problem when you try to sort of transfer results from studying Olympias um, to, say, the pyramid rules. Yeah, <coughs> uh, you said you are in an initial state of the question. Yeah. May I ask how you mean then to proceed with the topic? Yeah. Uh, the first thing we'll do is um, we try to sort of launch Olympias on a virtual scene. Let us create a um, a if you want, model of, of Olympias, um, that you can actually simulate Olympias and drive them around. Basically, create some sort of ship simulator um, where the ship that you, that you can run around is, is Olympias. Um, that would be the first step. The second step would then be um, try to create an environment where can I have several of that. And then find a solution for how you can actually um, sort of insert a command control function so that you can actually um, control different, uh, several different of these ships and then see what actually happens. How, how much space do they need? Um, what is safe spacing? I mean, I've told you that you probably need 30 meters. Is that the case? You can see this is, um, the ship is uh, almost 37 meters long. Um, one or uh, one tip of uh, the oar to the other tip of the oar, it's about 10 meters. Do I need 30 meters between two ships when I try to make a cook loss? Or would 50 meters be sufficient? I have no idea. Um, that is something that you could probably find out. I wouldn't say fairly easily, but moderately easily, um, when having 25 of these things to play around with. Essentially, what we want to do is, not to put it this, put, put this differently, what we'd love to do is having 25 of these to play around with. <laughs> of course, the main problem is, even if we find someone who actually built 25 of these, you'll never find enough crewmen yeah. to actually crew 25 of these, let alone try running tactics. <laughs> um, actually, the the uh, uh, Boris actually once told me that the Hellenic Navy explicitly um, vetoed trying ramming tactics. They, they wanted to try um, ramming tactics with, with a static target, and the Hellenic Navy said, no, we are, we are not going to do that. <laughs> uh, in a way, that meant, no, we are not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, and the, again, this is something that you could try out with, with a model. So that's well, the first the first step would be. Um, getting, if you want, virtual Olympias, and the second step would be um, cloning virtual Olympias in an, in an environment. And um, I have to add that the technology for that is already there. I mean, it's not that we have to reinvent the wheel. Um, ship simulated technology is out there, and um, it's more a question of adapting existing ship um, modeling technology to our, our needs rather than to sort of um, starting from scratch and reinventing it. Um, I just um, thought about the long life of the um, East Roman uh, clinic and Navy. Yeah. But for some hundred years. Um, and uh, there were no new information um, for you and this long well, life. There is actually. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> well, actually, there is a small corpus of, of naval texts beginning in the, in the, I think, 8th century, 9th century, something like that, mm -hmm. um, which are edited by Alphonse Dahn, I think, 40 years ago, something like that, in the, in the early 70s. Um, unfortunately, um, much of the material is on general matters like um, getting a fleet organized, improving the morale of your, um, of your men, how to best hold a pep talk, and much of what we can 
uh, much of the, of, of the examples that we actually find are examples taken from the, from the, from the classical world. We have to, um, the, the way we are trying to, to eventually establish the environment in which we we'll plunge the virtual world, yes, is by sifting through all the literary evidence that's there for tidbits of information on operational methods. And we, um, when we do that, we have to um, take a close look at the, the Byzantine material as well. Because um, it could well be that there is, um, because they very um, I mean, if you're interested in, in only Byzantine naval warfare, it's maddening how much they are fascinated with ancient warfare. Um, and I'm not talking about what they're actually doing. They're talking about what was done at Salamis. Um, but obviously, if you're interested in, in what, what happened at Salamis, it may actually be interesting to see what they thought was done at Salamis. So um, we have to, but that's one of the things we have to do there. More questions? Yeah, not so. Uh, I have maybe the last one, last chance. Um, do you know of similar approaches for simulations of other naval war scenarios from, from a later period where you can gain some experience yeah. and which are like like general aspects like water and, 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 and wind, yeah. influence of wind, for instance, yeah. which are more or less general, which you can lessons learned from other simulations from where you have a better source. Are there any? You know, that, that's, that's very interesting. Being a naval historian, the, <coughs> when we first came up with this, my, my first idea was for this. Certainly, someone else has done that before, and, and every now and then when I actually double into you know, computer gaming, I think there must be you know, tons of computer games, of simulated games on naval warfare out there, and, and then, if you start looking, you'll realize that you, your judgment is probably clouded by the fact that you are interested in naval history, because um, evidently it's an absolutely niche market. So, um, even as late as, I think, 2011, in one of the most important online fora on, actually on naval simulated games, the, the Substance Forum, there, there was a long thread titled with when, oh when, will they give us a decent age of sale simulator? Because as of 2011, there was none. Um, and in fact, in fact, as of 2014, there is none. Um, there is only, I think these days, uh, there is a company that actually has started the, the promotional train for the new game that claims to, to be a fairly well-made age of sale simulation of naval warfare, where you can actually sort of have some way of realistic control over um, a warship from the age of sale, and then sort of fight actions in the Caribbean or wherever. Um, I think there is I think in the, in the let's say in the um, in the games market there is something out there, um, but as I said, it's a niche market, so there is not a lot of interest uh, out there. And as far as I know, apart from the PCs, which tend to use interactive simulations fairly often, um, and even tactical simulations of naval warfare, um, once they are sort of broken down to very elementary elements um, for the, I think it was the, well, for one of the Trafalgar um, exhibitions, the British Museum did a small browser game where you could actually um, sort of play the Battle of Trafalgar, um, which was essentially just sort of a small icon of the ship. You click on the icon, move the icon, and then wait what happens. So it's not really a simulation, it's rather a sort of board game that has been transferred to a browser game. Um, apart from things like that, to the best of my knowledge, um, although ship simulations are regularly used for training, um, for example, well, training people who are going to command ships, 
Um, there has been no attempt at actually using them in an academic context. So they're not going to really do it. Yes, please. Is there a standard for a publication of the history of ancient naval warfare or anything like that? Uh, yes, well, I, I would. Um, Perhaps the best starting point still is the, the um, it's by, it's the age of the galley, and I just keep forgetting the editor. Um, uh, it's, um, it's on, but it should be on the, on the web page where the, on the abstract, on the abstract, yeah, it should be, there is literature um, on the, um, below the, the, the abstract, of, abstract of this talk, and, uh, obviously, on the trial ring, the, the standard works are by Morrison, Coates, and uh, Boris Wankoff, um, who has published in 2012 the final report on the Olympias, where there is um, some material on the tactics as well. Um, and the, the best introduction, as I said, is this book by Gardner, uh, Gardner, The Age of the Gallery, uh, which is a general introduction to Gallery that's from well, if you want, very early to put the right down to the um, early world period. 